Amen. Let me let me go ahead and get into the Word of God. Amen. 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 I'm you blessed in the Lord today. <laughs> Amen. I'm gonna go ahead. Thank you. Thank you all. Y'all been serving all day wonderfully, and uh, we appreciate the Lord for His goodness. Book of John, chapter four, verses forty-three through fifty-four. You will find these words in the New International Version. Amen. Thank God for this army of children and youth ushers in the house of God. Amen. I've had wonderful meetings this week with almost all the ministries, the men's ministry, youth ministry, uh, security, uh, dance ministry. So second Sunday in October, you begin to see our youth and children's dance ministries and worship. Amen. That's an amen moment. That's an amen moment. Okay. Amen. Somebody say, I, never, I never seen that before. Amen. John chapter 4, verse 43 through 54. And um, it is my custom on Wednesday nights to announce at the close of Bible study the preachment for Sunday. And so I had already released on Wednesday night. We had about 65 people in Bible study here. Amen. Had 22 up at Union Bethel North on Tuesday night. And so we're excited about the people who study the Word of God. And so somebody came and said, Rev, you didn't announce your sermon title. I think it was Brother Crump. Well, somebody uh, said to me, you didn't announce the sermon title. So I was like, and before I could realize it, it came out of the, my mouth just at the right time. And um, you all who were here Wednesday, you knew about as much as I did uh, at the time that the Lord announced it through me. You know, because sometimes God will talk through you, and you have to go back and figure out what he's saying to you. And the church said, amen. So here's where the Lord took it after I had declared just at the right time. In John 4, 43, after the two days he left for Galilee, Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, for they also had been there. Once more, he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick in, at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that the boy was living. And when he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, his fever left him. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and his whole household believed for just a few moments, just at the right time. Can you tell somebody what we're talking about? Just at? Man, just at the right time. Time waits for, oh, you know that one too. This may be the last. Timing is, oh, you're good. What, what, what time is it? Time heals, and it's really not time that does it. Because, you know, time will make some po folks more bitter than heal them. The hymn writer says it this way, time is filled with two kinds of time. There's God's time. We call it kairos. There's man's time. We call it chronos. This text for, sets forth a timeline which bears some examination. There's a man in the text who goes through a transformation of faith over a very short period of time. Maybe as we examine his journey, we can see our own journey of faith and conclude that God is speaking to us right now at just the right time. Will you walk with me into the book of John? 
uh, John opens up his book. He says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was with God. The same was in the beginning with God, and we beheld. The Word became flesh, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father. John, the apostle, is not so much concerned about all of the historical and chronological uh, exactitudes of the text. John just wants to help you to know that Jesus is the Son of God. And so some of the details that you find in Luke, you won't find in John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what we call synoptic gospels. They see the same thing together. Uh, but John is a little different. John just wants you to know that Jesus is God's son. And, and so John, in, in spite of all of the things that Jesus has done, he says, I just want to show you about eight signs. And so there are eight signs. There are really seven that Jesus shows, but the eighth one is in the text. In chapter, uh, John chapter 2, he turns water into wine. In John chapter 4, in our text today, he heals the sick. In John chapter 5, he heals on the Sabbath day. In John 6, he feeds the multitude. Later on in John 6, he walks on water. Over in John 11, he raises Lazarus from the dead. That's seven. And if you count those seven, that's the number of completion. But the eighth miracle and sign of the text is that he himself is raised from the dead. And that is number eight. Can you say amen thus far? At this point in the timeline, Jesus had visited at the wedding feast at Cana of Galilee, and he works his first miracle of turning water into wine. He then goes to Jerusalem and clears out the temple during Passover. He works many signs during this time there, and many people believed him because of the signs. Uh, over in John chapter 3, we have what we call Nick at night, and Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. He's a religious leader who is struggling with faith and understanding the things of the Spirit. Uh, as he continues you on through John 3 moving almost into 4 he's hanging out with his disciples in the Judean countryside when the religious folks discover the success of his ministry he leaves Judea and returns to Galilee you have to know how to route yourself out of unnecessary trouble and conflict when you don't have to have it uh, to get to Galilee this is the part that I like to get to Galilee he has to go through Samaria I'm so glad he went through Samaria Samaria are where the, what we call half-hearted, semi-religious folks were. That's the rest of us. I'm so glad he came through Samaria. Because when he came through Samaria, there was a woman at the well. I don't want to go through the whole story. But when he got through dealing with her, she got so on fire because of the message. She ran back to the city, told them they got excited. They came out. He ends up hanging out in Samaria for about two days. Uh, the whole city believed not because he had worked any signs. He did not do one sign at all in Samaria he simply shared the message and they believed because of the message and not because of his size after Samaria he head back to Cana this is the place where he first had success in ministry here we are in the story now he is there in Cana of Galilee and a royal courtier from Capernaum learns that he's there now Capernaum is about 20 to 25 miles northwest on the Sea of Galilee the Sea of Galilee Galilee is about 700 feet below sea level. So whenever you're going anywhere around the Sea of Galilee, you're always going down. You're always going down. Are you hearing me here? He came from Capernaum because of what had happened in Cana. He's a father who has a son that's near the point of death. He's a parent whose child is in a despairing situation. His son is about to die. So let's see what the timeline yields as we move a little farther in this text and see how the father gets to the end of this pericope. Will you walk with me for just these few moments this Sunday? I only have three points, and point number one is the father has a desperate faith. Uh, anybody ever had a desperate faith? When he comes to him, he begs Jesus, come down and heal my son. How many of us have had failed, uh, we have failed or flunked, we've been fired or flattened, and, and we can therefore identify with the father's desperate faith. I'm down at the bottom. Matter of fact, when I got to the bottom, the bottom just fell out and I find myself with nothing to lose but everything to gain. And so I'm coming to you out of my desperate situation. I, I have 
resources. I work for King Herod of Antipas, uh, I mean, uh, the Tetrarch, and so I have plenty of resources at my command, but I can't do anything. My son is dying. Come down and heal my son. I've tried everything else, and everything else has failed, so I'm coming because I heard something about your work and your labor. Uh, there's a desperate faith. Have any of us ever been in that desperate situation where we are desperate to get something from God? We are desperate. We have gone hither, thither. We've gone to and fro. We've tried everything else. No remedy works. No remedy. No result. Nothing is cooling our parchment. Nothing is easing our situation. And so we come to Jesus with this, this desperation faith, begging Jesus to do what needs to be done. I'm so glad Jesus doesn't hang up on us, but he allows us to come like we are. Anybody with me? Just like he moves with this father, he wants him to come like with the faith that you have, but then trust me to move you from desperate faith to the next level of faith in your journey. You're coming to me because of the signs you heard about, but I don't want you to get enamored with the signs. I want you to know me. Yeah, which moves me to my second point. He moves from a desperate faith to number two, a deliberate faith. Uh, he comes to Jesus and says, come down. Now, he is used to being large and in charge. And I don't suppose that he offended Jesus, but he says to him, come down and heal my son. Now, just like we saw in the text last week, Jesus brings out his scatter gun and rebukes everybody in the audience. Uh, I'm here to tell you, some of us, uh, when we think of Jesus, we think of the sweet little Jesus boy in the manger, but the reality is that when you hung out with Jesus, Jesus is going to read you up one side and down another. He would tell you about yourself in a minute, at the same time, lay his hands on your eyes, and you would be healed at the same time. And so Jesus having a had a way of talking to people that if he were really here right now talking to some of us, we would chunk Jesus the deuces and say, I I'm out of here. I can't deal with this kind of thing. And so Jesus hits his scatter gun and he said, how long I got to deal with y'all? Y'all faithless and unbelieving folk. I'm so tired of dealing with these situations. All y'all ever want is, is, is signs and wonders. All you want is fishes and loaves, but you don't want the one who makes it all possible. And, and so when he rebukes the father, then changes his tone and he adds this word, sir, would you come down because my son is going to die. Now, when you translate, sir, it's good man or whatever you want to translate it to. Uh, but one of the translations is curios, which means Lord. In other words, when he talks to him, you got to talk to him right. You know how the old folks used to say, put a handle on it. Yeah, you got to come at me. When you come at me, you got to come at me right. And so he says, Lord, come down and do something about my son. Watch Jesus. Jesus just looks at him and says, go. Your son will live. See, this is not go like you are free to go or you may be dismissed. This goal is get up and get to stepping. Mm -hmm. This is an imperative goal. And it infers that when you dip part whatever you ask me for is going to be different in your departure than it was when you arrive that's how Sunday morning worship ought to be that when you come up in the church you might have come with some situations you might have come with some stuff but when the choir gets through singing and the dance ministry gets through dancing and the preacher gets through preaching and praying you ought to be able as they say to go down from this place a little different than when you came I, I came I was burdened I came on the pain. I came with some difficult situation, but I'm going back a different way. Oh, Lord. It's the same kind of go that happened when 10 men had leprosy and they came to Jesus. Jesus looked them up and down and said, just go. Go show yourself to the priest. And the Bible says that as they went, they were here. It's that same kind of go. And so the Bible says in that 50th verse, it said, the man took Jesus at his word and departed. He hadn't seen a sign. He hadn't heard a message. He just took Jesus at his word and departed. He hadn't been to Bible study, hadn't been to prayer meeting, hadn't been to men's fellowship. 
He just took Jesus at his word and departed. He left and trusted his word and not just his wonders. You see, wonders produce all, but word produces faith. Uh, Jesus said, go, I'm going. He said, my son's going to live. I'm on my way. In a moment of time, his faith has moved from desperate to deliberate. He simply takes Jesus at his word, which is what the hymn writer says, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, and to know thus saith the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I love him, how I trust him, how I approved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more called my wife yesterday she's home they're home right now having a packing party and my plane leaves later this afternoon i'm praying that all the stuff will be packed when i get there and i just now don't y'all tell her this next week you know, um, that i can just you know come in as the chief and everything will be done uh but brothers you know it, it really ain't like that we yeah we we really don't run stuff we we, tr we say we do, but we really don't. Um, but I called her yesterday morning, baby, what you doing? And she said, I'm watching the opening of the African American Mus History Museum. And indeed, it was a stellar event. Uh, amen. And so Friday night, I was watching the speeches and uh, President Obama, and uh, they even let uh, President Bush come out of Texas one more time. Amen. I promise you, he went home yesterday. He went home, and we ain't sending y'all no more bushes. You got to, you know, Texas ain't sending us no more bushes. Amen. Um, but it's a place to learn, and I watched as they interviewed men and women, African-American, Caucasian, Asian people were uh, talking about it. It's a place to learn and have our faith reinvigorated. Uh, and one of the things that President Obama talked about was this 400-year journey. Uh, as you look over time, over 400 years, it should help with your confidence and your faith. You see, it inspires us to be deliberate because when we look at where we've come from, we ought to be able to conclude that if our foreparents could walk through that, then we ought to be able to walk through this. Oh, I just said something. Well, let me, maybe I need to back it up a different way. If you can look at the rock upon which slaves were sold ah, and be able to walk out of the parking lot and get in your car this afternoon, it ought to encourage you because if they can walk through that, certainly, I, you know, is there anybody with me here? Certainly I can walk through this. Uh, and, 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 and if that is the case that I can join the ancestors in the prayer it's a song but it really is a prayer guide me oh thou great Jehovah I'm a pilgrim through this barren land where, where, where's your barren land it's in Charlotte North Carolina it's, it's in Chicago Illinois it's, it's in Brooklyn New York God it's in Baltimore where is your barren land I am weak but thou art mighty and if you did it for them, you can do it for me. So hold me, hold me, hold me, hold me with your powerful hand. Uh, we move from a desperate faith to a deliberate faith. And finally, we get to the third point in 14 minutes and 26 seconds. It is a developed faith. When you move in deliberate faith, your faith grows as you move in obedience and submission to the word and instruction of the Lord. Let me say that once again. When you move in a deliberate faith, your faith grows as you move. <laughs> so you can sit as a bump on the log saying, if I had the faith, God is looking at you and say, fool, if you had the movement, your faith would grow. Get off the log. <laughs> Are you <laughs> See, you're trying to get, uh, put the cart before the horse. You want to see and then believe. And God is saying, no, you need to believe and then you'll see. Uh, are you hearing me up in here? Uh, and, and so the Bible says in verse 51 that while he was still on the way, he was walking in obedience to what he had heard. He was walking because God said, go, your son will live. As he was on the way, his servants met him with the news that your boy is alive. He is living. 
Well, let's unpack the on the way on the way in this man of developed faith. See, because of the distance and lateness of the day, it is about one o'clock based on the text. It is believed that possibly most of the writers believe that the father had to stay somewhere overnight. He had to be somewhere overnight because, you know, he couldn't just, you know, you know, get, get up in his Mercedes and head down 301, hook over on 5 and be up in Upper Marlboro. Just wasn't going to happen that way. Uh, he's about 28 miles from home. Now, if he has a horse, his servants don't, and he is a servant of the king, Herod. Herod. Uh, so if he's walking, he probably checked in. Maybe he was on his way up to uh, uh, um, uh, Virginia, uh, or maybe he'd been on his way up to Philadelphia. So he said, I'm going to spend the night in National Harbor, uh, and then I'll be on my way in the morning. Uh, if that is the thought, as most of the writers look at the thought, uh, it would explain a couple things. But let's take the fact or the reality or the approach that the man did stay overnight. There's some things that happen in night that don't happen in the day. First of all, he's going to bed. He got a word from God that says go. The word says go, your son shall live. Now his faith has moved from being desperate uh, to being what? deliberate he is going but he needs to stop and rest in the nighttime some things come to test us in the night seasons of our lives death walks in the night fear is magnified in the night anxiety is uh, is heightened in the night uh, that's what we're experiencing in charlotte north carolina with a nighttime curfew uh the so to quell the violence in the streets at the nighttime in the night season though some other things happen see wow well, you're sleeping God is working and what you have prayed while you went to sleep God's already got it in motion that's why the summers would stop and say yeah weeping may endure for a night but joy is coming in the morning and I hear the whiners talking about it looks like I can feel the breaking of day is there anybody in here who can realize that your day your night is not going to last and your tomorrow is going to be better than your today can you imagine the sense of anxiety that is now morphed into anticipation when he gets up that next morning? Maybe he reads his newspaper, goes down in the hotel lobby, has his continental breakfast, go ahead and does his early checkout, and he's on his way back home. But before he can get out on his way, his servants are meeting him with the news that his son is already alive. They moved him from intensive care to a regular room. They up graded him from critical to good and he'll be checked out as soon as the doctor makes his next round. Is there anybody up in here that knows that God will answer in the middle of the night and then manifest his glory early in the morning? You see, deliberate faith when you move releases you into your destiny, but it also brings your destiny to you. Whatever you prayed for last night, you on your way to it. But I got some news. God was working on it while you were asleep, and it's already on its way to you. How do you know? Just go to work tomorrow morning and see what God has already done. Uh, get back to your house this afternoon and see what God has already done. Look at your life situation and see what God has already done. Uh, well, let me close. In just a relative short time, the father's encounter with Jesus has moved his faith from desperate to delivered, to deliberate, to developed faith. And then I, I got bothered by verse 52. Uh, uh, because the thing I haven't missed seen in the text is there ain't no hallelujah, praise God, bless Jesus. Huh? Ain't no Ain't no shouting going on. He ain't speaking in tongues. He's not rolling under proof. He's not running. He's not running around the church. Huh? It, it, there's been no thank you, Jesus. There's no thank you, Jesus, in the text. Do you see that? I, I don't see. I didn't see it. And so when they brought him the news that his son was alive, there was no thank God. There was okay, but what time? Did that occur? 
Uh, he, he was probably a lower left quadrant personality. Uh, about what time did that occur? And his servant said, it was about 1 o'clock yesterday afternoon that the fever left him. Yeah. But then start, something started happening in his faith meter Something started going on inside of him. And he said, wait a minute. What time you said that was? 1 o'clock? That was the same time yesterday that I was standing in the presence of Jesus. And he told me, go, because your son's going to live. Ah, something, you missed your shout right then. You, I'm getting so excited. My afro is already growing back right now. <laughs> what, what, but why the notation of time is so important? How many of you ever called a customer service company when you've had a complaint or something that you need? And after a while, you're trained that when you get them on the line, you won't ask, now, what's your name? And how do you spell your name? Uh, what's your extension? What's your direct number? Or what's your employee ID? They'll give you all those. Then on your notes, you write the date and the time that you talk to them. And then you also write down the date and time because you want to validate the promise that they are making with you. So if you need to call back, you can say, no, on September 23rd at 10.35 a.m., I talked with Joe, and here's what Joe promised me that y'all were going to do. I wish I had somebody up in here. I wish I had somebody up in here. Sometimes when you're looking through the customer service manual and something strikes you, you have to read, you have to get your notebook and write down the date and the time that you read it. Because it helps you to certify that God's promise is true. When I was surrounded by my enemies, I read Isaiah 54 and 17, and it said, No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that rises in judgment against you, you shall condemn. When, when I was feeling a little weak and lonely, I turned over into the customer service manual, and I read, The Lord is my light and my salvation whom shall I fear the Lord is the strength of my life of whom shall I be afraid when my mother and my father forsake me then the Lord will take me up uh, uh, I read it in the manual and so I wrote it down and I timed and dated it that when I was a little lonely I turned over and I read lo I am with you always even until the end of the earth when you talk to the Lord and you read his word it's all right to note the date and time while God operates in Kairos the Lord understands that we operate in Kronos so we like to develop a chronology of the things that God has said which helps us to hold on to his promises that's why we got to remember just for Sunday last month God said just ask Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. You have to remember that God said on first Sunday, when God answers, that, that, that even last Sunday before last, somebody needed another touch. And last Sunday, I need some help. So when God sends his word, you ought to time it and date it that God is speaking just at the right time. Oh, Lord, now is when I need. I need to hear a word. I need a revelation. I need him to speak. I need him to heal. I need deliverance. I need victory. I need joy. I need a blessing. I need his vision. I need his purpose. I need his power. I need his grace. I need his mercy. Lord, I need. Lord, I need, Lord, I need, I need, I need, I need, I need, I need him, I need him now, I need, I need him now, I need, walk with me, talk with me, tell me 
that I am your own and the joy and the joy when do you need it I need it right now because right now is the right time hallelujah hallelujah stand on your feet all over the sanctuary I need mm. just at the right time just at the right time just at the right time yeah my time for miracle my time for healing my time for deliverance I need it right now need it right now there may be somebody here today and maybe you still didn't get everything God has for you that's all right you're in the right place at just the right time the first and foremost thing that we present to anybody is an opportunity to have a relationship with Jesus Christ now it's good if your name is on this church roll or other church hall somewhere maybe you're visiting here today that's fine that's wonderful but you need to know Jesus so watch this you you may already be a member of a church but you don't know Jesus and so the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart to get to know Jesus watch this watch this most important thing you can have when you come in the worship service and the worship of God is going on is to be given an opportunity to enter into relationship with Christ. Guess what? We don't want you to die and go to hell. We want you to know Jesus. Not because you're afraid of eternal life uh, or eternal damnation. Eh. When you walk in Christ, you don't have to live, live in fear of what's on the other side. The challenges you're going to face are on this side. So Jesus said, I come that you might have life and that more abundant. Eh. The believer is not exempt from what we go through in this world. The difference is who you got with you when you go through. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. We might have to go to the hospital. We might hear the physician say this is the case or these are the facts. Yeah, th those are the facts. But here, here's the truth. He was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. Chastisement of my peace is on him. And by his stripes, I'm healed. <laughs> That's the difference. That's the difference. Oh. I've been to the cemetery too. Huh. The difference is when you, when you have to say goodbye to mama and daddy or loved ones, the difference is it's not the undertaker that walks with you. There's only one who can dry your tears in the midnight hour. And his name is Jesus. And I'd love for you to get to know him. I want you to get to know him. Now, that, that, that shouldn't interfere with the next thing. If you already belong to church, that's fine. But you can belong to a church. You can have your name on everybody's church roll. And you still not make it to heaven because you don't know Jesus. So I want you to know Jesus. That's, that's the first appeal I'm making. The second appeal I'm making is for those who do need a church home. Maybe you're new to the area. So am I. I said goodbye to the hotel desk this morning. I said, I'm through. I see y'all. We're trying to get settled in our place next week. Jesus. Amen. So I'm new to the area too. So we can come on and get lost together at 301 and 5 and, you know, and Brandywine goes to Floral Park and hooks all the way around. And next thing you know, you're in Fort Washington. Sometimes I don't turn on the GPS, I just drive. <laughs> it's all right. So guess what? We can, we can wander together. And I'd love to be your pastor. Love to help you show, the way to show you the way to Jesus. I'm still an usher. I started at the front door when I was a child. I'm still an usher. I usher from the pulpit. My job is to usher you into the presence of Jesus. And it help you to stay there. So if you're here and you need to be saved, or you need a church home. 
I'm inviting you to come. I'm inviting you to come. I'm inviting you to come. As the choir is singing. Say. So what? Everyone I know. You if you're here. He thought you were worth saving. Yeah, you don't have to stay like that. Nobody but Jesus can do that. Nobody but Jesus can do that. Nobody but Jesus can do that. The Lord, amen. That's how you do it. Joy comes to renew her covenant of membership, amen. Amen. And so, I don't, I'm not putting you on blast, you know, because you know, I don't know who is a member who ain't. I really know that's why that's why I fish so hard on Sundays because I don't know who is who is, and then I don't want to overlook somebody. But, but here's a wonderful thing I'm gonna pray with you in just a minute. But here's a wonderful thing um, sometimes when you've just kind of didn't mean you, you backslid away from God, but sometimes we need our covenant renewed in the life of the church. That's what's called revival. When we are revived and renewed, and it's all right to need that. All right? Now, here's the technicality of it. If you've been outside of the, the ark of safety for six months, and you have been active six months, then you come back and say, I'm renewing. If you're gone more than a year, you are purged from the role in African Methodism. You're purged from the role because the stewards purge the role every year. And if you've not been participating in a year, you need to come all over again. Hello, somebody. So if you find yourself in either one of those cases, like Sister Joy, I'm not putting you on blast, but, but you need to come and renew. Today's a good day to do that. You, you know why? You know why? Because it's just at the right time. It's just at the right time. It's just at the right time. So if you're here, I want you to come. Come on, Christ, sing one more time. And I'm waiting. You need to be saved or you need a church home. That's what I'm dealing with right now. Or you need to renew your covenant. Somebody else, so I'll wait on you. Your life so I can be free, so I could be home, so I can tell everyone I know you thought I was Come worth on. saving. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. So you, you came and changed my life. You thought I was worth keeping. So you clean me up inside. That's all right. All you right. Amen. Remember, the, there's a good Sunday to do that. Just at the right time. So you sacrifice your life so I could be free, so I could be whole, so I could tell. God's doing something here. Saints ought to be praying right now. God's doing something up in here. Amen. We got somebody joining the church today. Come on, somebody ought to thank the Lord. Come on, thank him, thank him, thank him. Come on, give God some praise and glory in this place. People are renewing. People are joining. Ah, there's healing in this place. There's deliverance in this place. Yeah. I worship you. I'll give you glory. I'll give you worship. Because you deserve the glory. You deserve the glory. Hallelujah. I praise you forever. Help bring mother. Mother's coming too. Look at God. Look at God. Somebody ought to give God some praise in this place. Amen. We gonna bro brother Rodney. We are gonna bring mother right here. But I was worth saving. Yeah. yeah. You came. This why I come to church right here. Life, you Lives are restored. Yeah. 
Brokenness is healed. So you uh, clean me bondage up is broken. Inside. You thought I was to die for. Ooh, yeah. Mother's coming to renew. You come you on, get your seat. Y'all supposed to be shouting right there. That's, that's, your, that's your shout moment. Amen. Mother, you can sit right here. Amen. So I am be. Oh, somebody out there. This is the right time. Today's the right time. Today's the right time. Today's the right time. Hallelujah. You sacrificed your life so I can be free. Hallelujah. Just come on, give God some praise and his glory. Just continue to play that softly. And um, those of you here, Mother, good to see you. Just look at me for a minute. Um, I'm going to do this because this is, what we, this is the prayer that I was talking about earlier, the prayer of salvation. Salvation is as easy as A, B, C. Amen. You'll see Bishop Ingram, he teaches about that in the SAT manual. You'll get that in new members class, a refresher class. A, B, C. A, we admit... What are we admitting? That we've sinned and come short of the glory of God. Right now, I want you to get a good look. I want you to look around the whole room. This ain't y'all have sinned. It's we all. All right, you see? See all them? Yeah, they may, they may not admit it, but we all have sinned. <laughs> we all have sinned. So we admit. All right? Um, it, it's like flying a kite. And when the kite gets out of sight and you can't see it, the only way you, you, you know it's still flying is you got to pull on it. So every day, believe it, believe it, when you wake up in the morning, you're, you got to pull your kite string. Make sure you're still connected. Make sure your kite didn't crash in the middle of the night. You still, you, you got me. All right. We admit that we have sinned and come short of God. B, we believe. Where does belief occur? Where does the belief occur? Hmm? In your heart. Watch this. No one can give it to you, and no one can take it away from you. Yeah. Now, there are some faith killers and dream despisers and, and hope killers that try to destroy that. But the faith in God is untamperable. That's why we stay within earshot of the man of God. You got to stay within earshot of your shepherd because there's where faith is activated and stirred up constantly through the preached word. So A, B, C. C, we confess. What are we confessing? We are confessing that Jesus Christ is our Lord and our Savior. That's the Romans way, Romans 10. He said, if we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, we shall be saved. That's it. That's it. Just that. It is just that simple. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm not doing this to insult your exist, pre-existent faith. That's good. That's good. I'm doing this to strengthen your faith. <laughs> so, so watch this. While you're praying, I, I guarantee you, most everybody in this room is going to join me in this prayer. All right? Use my words, but let it come from your heart. All right? Pray with me. Lord Jesus, today is the right time for me. Thank you. For this day, I admit that I have sinned. I'm sorry, Lord. Forgive me. Cleanse me. I believe in my heart that you are the Savior of the world. And you came to save me. I confess you are my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me. Save me. Cleanse me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can have the power to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. 
Now, my Father, my God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we thank you for these that have come renewing and confessing their faith. We thank you for this season of renewal and restoration in their lives in the name of Jesus. We pray for healing, health, and wholeness. We shelter them under the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, God, and we thank you. Fill them now with the Holy Ghost so they can have the power to live for you, oh God. And we thank you for redemption. Though no matter what it was, we thank you for a brand new beginning. Oh, in the name of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is over their lives. We plead it and cover them in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And we thank you. Today is the right time. Today is a day of salvation. Today is a day of joy. Today is a day of reclamation. I've been renewed. Oh, and I thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Somebody ought to give the Lord some praise in this place. Uh, was worth saving. You're worth it. You came You're worth it. My life. You yeah. thought I was worth oh. keeping. So you cleaned me up inside. You thought I was to die for. So you sacrificed your life. So I can be free. So I can be home. So I can tell everyone I know. Okay. Now, um, you're joining. You're renewing. That's fine. Renewing, renewing. That's wonderful. This is Reverend Deborah Ray, and she's going to take you into place and pray with you. Get some updated information, so make sure... And then I got a letter that's coming to you in the mail. And then you'll have an opportunity. See, Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. You know what happened to some of the church folk? They've been asleep since Jesus said that. Because they missed the second part. The second part of that is take my yoke upon you and learn of me. That's where you grow. In the learning of God's word and that's what gives you that confidence to say my tomorrow's gonna be better than my yesterday because God promised in his word it gives you that confidence all right and watch this no what watch this um just look around the room look around the room look just take a look take a look look at all okay look at look at them all <laughs> none of them have a heavenly help put you in so don't worry about it um, um the reality is we are all tore up from the floor up. And I'm taking time to, to, to do this because sometimes, you know, some of the most difficult folk to deal with sometimes are folk who, who say they change. We going through changes. You're supposed to be like the wind, being able to be blown by the spirit. The people who talk about they've changed are the ones who don't want to change. So this is your time to allow God to transform your life. No matter where you were, mother, that got you here at this moment, this is the right time for you. Amen. So I want you to go with Reverend Deborah. She's going to get some information from you and make sure you get letters and make sure we're in touch and all that renewing and all of that kind of good stuff. Okay. All right. Come on, give the Lord some praise for these to come. We want to make sure. Hmm? Okay. All right, praise the Lord. Come on, give God some praise for these that have come. Come on and tell the Lord, thank you. Thank God for souls being saved, people joining the church. Amen. Now, let's receive our offering, and then I've got... I got a plane to catch in a little bit, but let's receive our tithes and offerings this morning. Now, I want to thank you, and through the consultation with the leaders of the church, uh, we're going to continue the new season seed offering. Thank you. You've given $15,000, about $15,000 so far. Um, next Sunday, we'll have one of those thermometers in the, in the foyer, and you can see where we are. It'll be up on the screen and all of that. They're working on that to make sure that's updated. 
Wonderful things are happening here. Wonderful things are happening at UB North, and we thank God for it. So we want to encourage you to continue to sow into the new season seed offering all the way through 31st of October. Amen. And uh, we knew we were just coming off the summer, and so the leadership said, Let, yeah, let's push it on. God's doing wonderful things in this new season. So I want you to stand up for on your feet. In the back corners on both sides are the merchant terminal. Very shortly, we will also have a giving kiosk, and the stewards will let us know where that's going to be stationed. It'll be easy for you just to give electronically before you even come into the service. Amen. Uh, and we're making, uh, working on processes to make that uh, even more uh, uh, easy for you to do that. How many of you all received a letter yesterday from me? Amen. Some people did. Okay, some people, you already got it in the mail. Amen. All right. So some of you'll get it tomorrow for sure. But it's my first congregational letter to the congregation. Pray that you would read that and study uh, those things that we have set forth, the things that God has called us to, to worship, to pray to study, and to sow. That's what God is calling for in this new season. Won't you stand upon your feet if you've already given online? Uh, that's fine. Just hold up your hand in the presence of the Lord. You gave it the early service. Or you gave it north. Father, thank you for seed to sow. Bless the seed and the sower, the gift and the giver. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. The ushers are going to direct you down the center. And if you have an electronic gift through Merchant uh, Terminal, on both sides in the back, you can go straight there with your debit card right now. In Jesus' name. Sing the praise. We sing the praises to our King. For He is the King of Kings. We sing the praises to our King, for He's King of Kings. We sing. 